Hello, hello, this is Alex Burkett, and you're listening to the Long Game Podcast. In this episode, I'm talking to Adrian Barnes. Adrian is a content marketer focused on B2B SaaS, and she's also the founder of Best Buyer Persona. She's incredibly talented, especially in the areas of content marketing strategy and customer research. In this conversation, we cover her journey to becoming a freelancer and also starting Best Buyer Persona, how to conduct customer research the proper way to inform your content marketing strategy, as well as other areas of marketing and product. And we also cover her hopes and dreams and goals for the businesses that she runs. Adrienne is super sharp and passionate about this stuff, and I think you're going to find this conversation both entertaining and highly useful and tangible in your day-to-day work. Without further ado, here's my conversation with Adrienne. Cool. I wanted to ask you, you're, you're in Texas, right? I am. I'm in Fort Worth. Nice. Have you always been in Texas or are you from Texas? I am mostly. I mean, like it wouldn't count, but I was born in Oklahoma and we moved here when I was four. So pretty much. Yeah. So basically a lifelong Texan. Yeah. Lifelong Texan. I've really thought about moving and we've had lots of opportunities where it's like, maybe we'll go to North Carolina. Maybe we'll go to Florida. And at the very last minute, I'm like, "Mm -mm, no, here's where it is. This is where I'm staying. There's something about this state that just keeps you here. I'm in oh. Austin now and I've been here for seven years. I plan on being here for two years, maybe. Yeah. But every time I think about moving anywhere else, there's just this question in my head, like, where else? Like, where else? What's better? <laughs> exactly. And I've been other places. Like, I love to travel. Travel is one of my favorite things. And I don't even mind long-term travel. I'll stay a place, you know, a month or so. But everywhere else, it's like, that's great. It's just not, it's not Texas. It's, and this weather we're having this week, I mean... I'm sorry, 80s in July in Texas. was incredible. I'm, I, we just had a picnic outside with the kids because I was like, we have to enjoy this. This is a beautiful day. <laughs> um, what's the most Texas thing about you? Probably my wardrobe. I'm going to be real honest. I have, um, I'm not wearing it now, but pretty much every t-shirt I have that has print on it is the state of Texas and a Texas saying, I have one that's Texcellent. I had like, just, I love... Yeah. And y'all, I say y'all with no remorse, without abandon before it was cool to say y'all that you're just going to hear that from me. So people would cringe and be like, Oh, you from Texas. You just said y'all. And I'm like, yes, <laughs> I, I think it's probably the, the best, uh, I don't know. Plural it's, pronoun. It's the best, yeah, it is. It's, it's inclusive. It sounds friendly. I've uh, co-opted it. It felt super strange at first because I'm from Wisconsin initially, but now yeah. I try to use it all the time and I love it. It's perfect. And then you've got all y'all and y'alls. I mean, it has its own forms and all y'all is hilarious to me. It's like a double plural. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. But when you're here, you're like, oh, y'all is like a smaller subsect. And all y'all is like that, the whole group are all y'all going? Is everybody going to go? So yeah, that's probably the most Texas thing about me. That's funny. Yeah. I keep thinking, I mean, when you travel, Oh, oh, sorry. Okay. That's pretty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's that's pretty Texan. When when you travel, you get like a very quick perception or quick judgment from somebody when you say you're from Texas. And I don't know exactly what those things are that people think in their heads. Mm-hmm. I would imagine it's something like cowboy hats, cowboy boots, guns, barbecue, you know, that kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of also political affiliations, mm. you know, they automatically assume they know every policy and politic that you agree with or disagree with. Um, which is interesting because Texas is probably the most purple state. I don't know all of the things, but we're very diverse, lots of huge metropolises. So yeah, it's definitely interesting or just, you know, kind of country backward, that kind of thing. But hopefully I think, I think that perception is starting to change with tech moving to Austin and more people be like, Oh, actually this is a really cool state to be in. And the people are cool. Yeah, I think so. Um, so you run a freelance business and you also run, um, a buyer persona business. Are those the same thing or do you delineate those in any, any concrete way or how do you approach like your work nowadays? Yeah. So I have A and B B2B SaaS content marketing consulting. That is basically the freelance business. That's my content strategy. Um, I stopped writing for clients last year and really leaned heavy on content strategy and that's been going really well. Um, mostly that engagement looks like I'm someone's content lead. So I kind of come in before they're ready for a full-time hire, but they know they need content and they're trying to fill that gap. That's where I kind of come in. Um, Usually they're three to six month engagements. And so that's 
that freelance business. And then I, I do, I have a hard line with the best buyer persona and that I'm dreaming is going to be a small consultancy with maybe like five people. Everybody kind of has their own um, roles to play and strengths to lean into. Um, and that is where we do a lot of market research, like buyer intelligence, digital intelligence analysis, and create these huge, but effective and actionable buyer personas. Do those ever overlap? I know that buyer personas can be a bit broader in terms of their utility, but they often do coincide with content marketing. So yeah. do you often find you're uh, utilizing kind of both of those arms of the business um, Absolutely. when you yeah. do content marketing? Yeah, it mostly starts with the buyer persona. So they'll hire me for a buyer persona. They want the research. And then once I've given them all of the data and said, like, this is how you can use it. These are the words your clients are using, your customers are using. Uh, you know, the buyer persona also leans into media publications and and social media that people use in different ways to uh, actually use the buyer persona. Then they're like, oh, hey, great. All that looks really good. Now, can you help us create a strategy now that we know all this? Can you go and create us a content marketing strategy? So that's happened quite a few times where they know they need the research and then that kind of leads into a content marketing strategy, but they're not, it doesn't always happen. It, it, they play well together, but they can be um, separated and exclusive to each other. Gotcha. That makes sense. Do, how, do you, how do you define a buyer persona um, just to like step it up on a higher level? Yeah. So I love that question because um, a lot of people do it a lot of different ways and I'm being told from like, standard conventional marketers that what I'm doing is not right, is not a buyer persona. And I've just kind of adopted this way of thinking because of my content marketing background. Um, so when I say a buyer persona, I really do mean one document that will inform how your buyers behave, why they buy, and uh, who they are. So it really answers all those three questions. Um, and Right now, the clients are being able to use them for product, customer success, sales, marketing. It's not just one thing that sits in marketing and only informs marketing. It really is the kind of document that that informs everything. So it's different than your standard buyer personas because I'm not just creating these fake persona profiles with Mary Marketer. Actually, I'm, I'm very much against Mary Marketer. I'm very much against having a picture um, a name for your buyer persona, um, you know, the age, race, gender, that being the persona. I don't think, why do we have to fake ourselves into thinking that if we're marketing to one person, we're going to be more personalized with this, you know, group of people. Um, I feel like there's so much room for bias and just complications when you do that. So that, that's one of the main differences between mine and a, and a standard persona for sure. Do people even use the standard personas? Because I'm pretty sure I was at HubSpot before this, and yeah. I'm pretty sure we actually had a persona named Mary Marketer or something like that. It may be uh -huh. a different name, but it's it's definitely something like that. And I don't remember a single time that I looked at whatever you know presentation or spreadsheet or whatever that data was on. Yeah, I don't ever remember using that for anything that I did. Yeah, and I don't know anybody else that did either. They don't. Um, actually, I did a poll with um, a company called Audience that I partner with. And we asked in-house marketers and agencies, what, like, how often do you create them? And I think the answer was 85% of companies create a buyer persona. And then I said, okay, how often do you use them? 77% said never. And then I tried to get more specific and say, do you use them when you do a product launch? Or maybe when you're starting a new campaign or like all of these really specific instances where I could think this is where a buyer persona should be used. And the answer across the board was, no, we don't use them. We don't ever refer back to them. We're not looking at them. It's not informing business decisions. And so that's where I decided, you know, this has become a check the box marketing practice. Like some CEO puts it on the yearly to do, the CMO gets the to do, and then, you know, probably passes it down to somebody, a content marketer, maybe they do it themselves and it's a weekend project or they hire it out to an agency and agencies are like batch cooking these personas and doing 10 or 15 a day that, you know, one, maybe research analyst, maybe if you're lucky, it's doing it. Um, yeah, they're, they're not really used very often. And that's something that I think is a shame. I'm highly invested in efficiency and like having, like, if we're going to do something, 
let, let's do it right. And let's make it something that we can use. Otherwise, why do it at all? Um, and I think that's why a lot of people are like, we don't buy our personas are w- useless. They're wasteful. We don't do them. And I say, well, I think it sucks because the process is wrong and we're not doing it with action or like with uh, something, a method involved. We're not actually thinking about how we're going to use it when we create it. We just create it and then never use it. Mm-hmm. So this is interesting because I come from the world of CRO and there's, um, I don't know if it's a debate, but I, I kind of ponder from time to time, whether it's better that companies do experiments at all, even if they're like not poor or not well done, mm-hmm. you know, if they're like using data inaccurately and not doing the right research and testing random stuff, or whether the absence of experimentation would actually be better in that case, because then they'd waste less effort, mm. right? Because if you're doing experimentation wrong, not only might you get wrong answers to the questions you're trying to ask, but you're also wasting the effort on things that you could have done outside of that. So do you have opinions on, like, is it better for a company to create buyer personas, even if they're kind of like the poor, like the old, the standard ones, or is it better that they just don't do it at all, given those two options? Yeah. If those are the only two options, um, I mean, think about it, you know, at least think about who are your best buyers, put something together. Um, I don't think you have to follow a template though. Like maybe if you're really just going to sit down and you don't have time to interview customers, you don't have time to send out a survey, you don't have time to talk to sales, you don't have time to review sales, like gong calls. Um, I mean, that's a, I think a rare circumstance, but if that's someone's situation, sit down and think about like who the buyers, I think that'd be better than not doing anything at all. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I guess the process itself, you're probably going to learn some things, even if you never use those, even if you never uncover them again, like you're probably still going to learn something about the process of of learning about customers. Absolutely. And I like to say it doesn't have to be one huge project that you stop everything and sit down and like, okay, team, we're working on the buyer persona and this is six weeks of our effort and all of that stuff. Or you hire out a consultant like me. It could be where you just say, I'm going to get on the phone with one customer once a week. And at the end of the year, we're going to have a really solid, buyer persona, but it might, it'll take you longer because you'll be going at it slower, but you'll be able to use those insights just as well as anybody else. Mm -hmm. What, uh, when done correctly, what is the utility of a buyer persona um, or the process of building a buyer persona, especially for content marketing? I know you can Mm -hmm. use them for sales and product and design and everything, but how does a content marketer actually get use out of a buyer persona? Yeah, absolutely. So in my buyer personas, I have a slide that I call frustrations and aspirations. And then other ones where I have um, what I call relational keywords. So those words that your customers are using about your product, right? So the frustrations becomes for me, that's our how-to content. If they don't know how to do something, I need to teach them how to do it in my content marketing. So it, it really does create a clear connection line between this is what our customers don't understand. This is what I need to teach them. Um, aspirations or delights, if, they, if they're bragging on something, if they're like, this was so great, we love this. That's a case study. That's a testimonial. Mm-hmm. That's, you know, you can turn around and turn that into all kinds of things. Um, really constantly while I'm having these interviews, especially when I do, because I do what's also called a reader persona for my content strategies. So it's a much smaller buyer persona. It's maybe five or six interviews. It's not the full 20, but every question I ask, I'm linking it to now, what kind of piece of content could that be? It's either this is a how to or a how we, I know Mm. that was Ali's. She said, rather than saying like, this is how to do it. We go and get somebody else, one of our other customers who's been an uh, an expert in this. And we're going to share how they accomplished it. That was genius. And I immediately put that into effect. Um, for some of my clients and the content went off great. So that worked out really, really well to be able to share someone else's story, but still sharing how to be successful with the product. Um, very cool. Nice. So you said this is a reader persona. This is a separate thing than the the general buyer persona. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The reader persona sits in my content strategy uh, offering essentially. So it's because this is already a part of my skill set. Um, what I like to do is start every content strategy with original research. So I don't start with keyword research or, um, you know, just basically Googling what I really do or seeing what the competition is doing. I go straight to our customers, our buyers, and I ask them just questions like, why are you using our product? What did you love? What are you still struggling with? Those kinds of uh, job to be done type questions um, and their answers directly correlate to what kind of content you'll see in the 12 week strategy from me. Mm, gotcha. So does the reader persona, is that part of the process that you would use to build a overall aggregate buyer persona or are those two separate artifacts, if you will? 
it's almost the same thing. The reader persona is like a mini buyer persona. So I don't get into um, like the media and publications that they read or a lot of customer segmentation or the buyer journey that the buyer persona will have. But I do want to make sure I know um, their frustrations, their problems, who they are, where do we need to go to promote to them? Are they more like, more on Twitter or Instagram or wherever it is? Um, I like to know what kind of content they are reading and consuming and engaging with. So that's a piece of it. But I'm not necessarily saying here is the best segment of your customers. I'm trusting that they already know that and they've presented me with those people. And now I'm saying here's where they uh, spend their time online and here's the kind of content we need to create to, to meet their needs. So th this is just a very focused form of a buyer persona, almost on content, non-blogging. Yes. Yeah. That's awesome. So tell me more about the relational keywords. That's a really interesting idea. Does that relate to, I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, grow and converts concept of like the pain point SEO, where they start by doing, you know, customer research and then map those two search keywords later. Yeah. Um, is that similar? Or how do you describe relational keywords? Yeah, that pretty much is similar. So um, I came up with the term because I, I was, I knew we all use SEO keywords and I was doing SEO keyword research and I was like, but I'm trying to, everyone says, use the words of your customers, use those words for copy. And I was like, there's gotta be a term, something I can say quickly rather than we're gonna use the words of your customer. Um, and so I wanted to be able to identify what those were and highlight them and make sure that the, uh, my clients knew that these were important terms. Um, and so it just kind of occurred to me like, oh, relational, because they're showing the relationship between the company and the client and their customer. So for instance, I, I use the sneaker and shoe example. If you are you know, a designer shoe store and you've created shoes and then you do this research and all of your copy on your website is shoes and they're beautiful and shoes and shoes. And then um, you do all these interviews and you realize your customers are calling them sneakers. It's probably time to change your, your content and your copy to sneakers. Not that people can't understand that a shoe and a sneaker is the similar similar things, but it goes along with that uh, story brand concept of like, don't make people overwork, really give them simplicity. Um, so yeah, I, I really like to identify those, those words and that helps to then create um, pieces of content and kind of filters that through, or we filter the content through that lens, essentially. How do you find those relation, re relational keywords or that voice of customer insight? Yeah. So that's via the interviews. I have for the reader persona, like I said, it's about five or six. And what I do is I transcribe each of the interviews. Um, I will copy and paste and move the topic. So if I ask a question, like I said, I know that the question is tied to a problem or a piece of content in my head. So I highlight the topics that I'm asking, pull out questions or pull out the, the quotes, the responses from the customers, put it underneath the topic that it belongs to. Then I do word clouds. So each topic will get pulled, put into a word cloud, and then it becomes really clear and simple. Like, oh, these were the words they use the most. This is the word that's most defines their problem. This is the kinds of language that they use when they're uh, discussing how happy or pleased they were with the product or what they still want to learn or just different things like that. It becomes really, um, it's kind of fun and it becomes very clear that the language that they've used. Gotcha. Do, do these things, so I can see them working in two different ways, right? Like these things could translate directly to a keyword or a topic. Like if you find, for instance, that somebody's talking about the problem areas around, um, you know, maybe they're a marketer and they don't understand how to interact with customers live on their website, right? So mm -hmm. that could be an interesting article about live chat or chatbots or something like that. But then also there's this kind of more qualitative, subjective, um, tone-based kind of thing you can get from that as well, which is how people speak about topics. Mm -hmm. And that can maybe filter into a content brief, which is like, hey, describe these things in these words. Or maybe that could translate into your editorial style guidelines, which is mm -hmm. like, this is how our customers talk. So, you know, use informal language or stuff like that. Do you, do you funnel those insights into both of those channels? Or what do you do with the relational keywords specifically when you're like working on a content strategy and presenting that to clients? Yeah, absolutely. It 100% can. If I'm working on the messaging, if we don't have that clear yet, and it looks like um, it's very clear via those handful of um, interviews that we've done. And, you know, I also do a little bit of social listening. So that kind of helps gather the tone as well. Um, it, it can be translated into individual briefs where we can say, this is the language you need to use to 
um, you know, portray this problem. This is the language you need to use to portray the solution, whatever the situation might be um, in the piece. And then it can also really inform a larger messaging, like the guide, essentially, like, this is your overall tone, you, you know, don't use the Oxford comma, or absolutely do the, use the Oxford comma, or uh, contractions are great, or no, they really do prefer um, more formal language. Um, you know, it, it helps to inform at a granular and an, an overhead level as well. Gotcha. How did you get into freelance writing? And how did you kind of arrive at this point in your career? Yeah, so I was a stay at home mom that had three little ones. My youngest had just turned one and I was starting to like sleep through the night and kind of like use my brain again. And I was ready to work. I was a teacher by trade before I was ready to work, but I had these little kids. I didn't want to go into an office to work. I really do enjoy being a mom. We homeschool. So that's a large part of my life as well. So I needed something that would kind of let me stay home, but still allow me to work and earn a little bit of money. I wanted something that was mine. Uh, and I had a friend who she had a house and a mortgage and a kid, and she never like had to go into an office. And so I was like, what, what do you do? How, how do you earn money? And she said, oh, I'm a copywriter. And I'd never heard of a copywriter before. I was like, okay, what is that? She sent me to some how to make a million dollars as a freelancer blog post. Um, and quickly I figured it out that, oh, this is, this is writing. I'm an English major. I was an English teacher writing reports and research has been my favorite. Like that's the stuff that I love to do. Um, and so I quickly, I studied like direct response, copywriting, landing pages. And I realized I don't want to do that kind of writing, but I love doing this content marketing stuff, like researching and writing reports. Um, and so I just started, I got on Upwork and I was on Upwork for a couple of months and wrote some stuff. And then I was like, okay, I think I'm better than this. Um, I hired Kaylee Moore as a coach and said, like, I know how to write. I know my writing is great, but I don't know how to run a business. I need, I need some direction and like, how did I make this a thing? Um, and really just tried to make good friends with people and connections and started writing for more companies, B2B SaaS, that whole niche just fell into my lap. Um, and I love it. I love working with founders. They're so inspirational. Um, and then, so once you are on a few, um, with a few clients and in the back end of marketing teams and asked to execute on some content, my first question was, okay, who am I writing to? Who's your audience? Like, what are their pain points? What are the things we need to say? Um, and very few people could tell me very clearly who their audience was. And I would ask them to send me buyer personas. And mo some of them were awful. Some of them were great. So it's like I learned what not to do from the awful ones and took the great ideas from the people who did great stuff. Uh, and so I just started researching qualitative analysis and interviewing and uh, coding data. And I probably spent two years um, giving myself a master's degree in all things that are required to do this buyer personas of stur survey design, UX, uh, content marketing and content design. Um, and that really became Best Buyer Persona, the process that informs personas. Um, and so, yeah, doing the, the freelance writing and then switch it into the strategies. It's kind of, that's, that's the evolution. It's been about four and a half years now. So, Wow. That, I mean, that seems like a relatively short time frame so far. Like there's, there's still so far to go in, in that sense. Did you, um, how did you learn all that stuff about survey design and all the buyer persona stuff? Where did you go? Yeah. Um, um, survey design. I, ju I basically scooped up 150 surveys and I studied them and reviewed them. And I asked if I could see, like I got in touch with people and said, Hey, I saw you did this survey. Can you tell me how this question performed. Um, I read a lot about um, like UX design, just being mm. able to really formulate words and questions. And surveys are really in particular because you have to, they have to be balanced. They have to be um, fair. They have to make sense to somebody else. The question has to make sense with the, the type of answer you allow. So are you asking a rating question or a multiple choice question or all kinds of things. Um, that one was really interesting. I asked people to send me their surveys and then I would just ask them like, Hey, how did, how did this go? What, what was great about it? What failed? Um, and that was fun. And then just doing, I did, I asked a lot of surveys. I sent out surveys for various things and, and learned uh, via practice. 
for the um, qualitative and quantitative data analysis, I basically picked up any book I could find on how to interview. I was reading from uh, oh, social social workers, basically mm-hmm. the people who do um, like social work scientists. I was reading from journalists, um, other kinds of who is like just product research people. I've got um, just enough research by Erica Hall by my desk, just tons, any information I could find out there. Um, I took a few free like online courses just to figure out what are the basics of a good interview? How do you gather data from people? How do you ask a stranger questions and get some accurate answers? So it, it was it was a good process and I'm still learning. I don't want to, you know, ever feel like, okay, great. I learned all there is to know about all the things. Like there's always something to learn. Yeah, that's that's badass. Um, I think that survey design is one of the hardest things that I've I've had to do. I used yeah. to do that a lot in terms of like conversion research. And I, I think I learned in a similar way through largely UX professionals. But then I also I studied journalism in school and I feel mm-hmm. like that gave me sort of a mental model to always seek to ask the questions that are going to provide the most rich answers and follow up on those. So I felt like that was an interesting framework as well. Yes. Um, why did you study English? Oh, why did I? Okay. So I'm a nerd and I'll, I'll tell you about, I'll give a story about why I'm such a nerd. Last night I was on Twitter and somebody asked a question about what's are the, the most books with the beautiful prose in it. And so everyone's giving book title recommendations and author recommendations. And they're just the words they were using to describe the books, just like my heart melts and I get so excited. I love reading. I love researching. Um, I'm the kind of nerd that really, when I was an English teacher, before I had kids, I had, it was my second year of teaching. So I was like, okay, now I'm bored. What, what should I do now? Um, I thought I was going to go to law school. So I wanted to go to law school. Um, it sounded amazing to like research and just be sitting at a desk with stacks of books around you, you know? And one day I was at the table with my husband and he was like, so you're going to be a lawyer. Like, this is cool. I had, I had, mind you, my LSATs scheduled. I was ready to go. And uh, I was like, no, I don't want to be a lawyer. I'm, I'm still going to be a teacher. I just want to go to law school. And he was like, hey, hey, babe, how about we find another way for you to research and not go $100,000 into debt? That might be cool. So <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, okay, that's probably true. Um, I just, I love it. I love learning ideas and talking to other people about ideas. And, and yeah, I get, I get romantic about it. It's just my favorite. No, that's awesome. So I I ended up as a journalism major. Actually, it was a specialty called strategic communications, which is like advertising PR type of thing, but in the J school. But for about a year, I was going to double major in English and business. And English was always my favorite subject. And I think if I could go back and study something again, it would probably be an English lit degree. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think it was because I... Well, one loved reading, of course, you know, F. Scott Fitzgerald, the whole 1920s expat community. Like I loved those books. Um, But I also had teachers early on that I felt like gave me a lot of support and encouragement. And they were, Mm -hmm. it was two English teachers in particular was, did did something like that kind of nudge you towards that as well? Um, I'm guessing with your career as well, being a teacher yourself. Yes, absolutely. So I was actually an education major at first. I was going to teach. I knew I didn't want to teach kindergarten. But I was like, oh, I'll probably just teach, you know, middle school or something kind of a generalist teacher. They, the way you can do it in Texas is you can have a generalist education uh, certification or you can be very specific if you're going to teach high school. Um, and I was in sophomore English at Texas Wesleyan University. And it was a class. We were a small university. So it was a class of maybe like 20 something. And um, Dr. Battles was my professor and she would ask questions and we would have reading and nobody in the class would respond. And I'm the kind of student where if I know the answer, I'm going to answer. So it was me and Dr. Battles for an entire semester, the only two having any conversations so bad to the point. I looked around the class at one point. I was like, really guys, nobody else is going to talk. Like you're going to make me do the whole work. Um, And at the end of that, she was like, you know, you really should consider getting an English degree. You're really good at this. And so I thought, you know what? I actually do love it. And I would like, wouldn't mind teaching, teaching it in high school. So I switched majors and finished with an English degree and got my alternative teacher certification. That's cool. I really, I I think I miss most uh, 
about English and, and generally college, you know, a lot of the humanities classes would have these, but outside of the lecture, you would have those group discussions. And I, I really mm-hmm. miss doing those. That's something that I think we should carry into adulthood, which I guess you can with a book club or something like that, yeah. but I feel like it's not necessarily the same, you know? Yes. I love pompous literature conversations. They are absolutely my favorite. Academics, people who use $10 words and want to discuss ideas. At Wesleyan, we were small enough, we would get to have those conversations in class. So that was the majority of my class time was reading a book and then talking about it. And I was like, how do you not love this? How is this not the most amazing thing ever just to read wonderful literature, the canon? I mean, we went through like pretty much what anybody would consider the canon and then just talked about it with other interested people. Did you early on get to go through like the different frameworks or lenses with which you can analyze literature? Like uh, you can look at it through a deconstructionist lens, uh, economic, like Marxist lens. Like there's all these kind of different ways you can like read into a text and like read different messages and symbolism and stuff like that. Yes. Did you guys ever cover that stuff? I think so a little bit. It's been a, it's been a bit now since I graduated. Um, but yeah, a lot of, mostly some of my classes were either economics lenses or feminist lenses. We tended mm-hmm. to be, to run um, in that kind of vein of, of looking through the literature for sure. We re- yeah, we, we read one single book and looked at it through a feminist lens, a Marcus Marxist slash economic lens, uh, deconstructionist and a couple others. I can't remember all of them either, but the reason I ask is because it sounds like you've taken the similar approach of, I don't want to say skepticism, but looking at something from multiple angles with buyer personas, right? You've yeah. got this artifact and this process that exists and most people take it at face value, but it seems like you dove in and said, wait, 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 what are we trying to do with this? And like, which aspects are actually aligning with the utility that we, we think we're providing and which ones aren't? And it, it sounds like you, you've taken that almost deconstructionist lens to the work you do in marketing and also yeah. the teaching aspect of it too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I honestly wouldn't have connected that, but it, it's true. I have a, a sense of just efficiency. I really want things to make sense. If, it, if we're not, if it doesn't make sense, if we're not using it, why waste time? Why waste four hours even doing it? So yeah, absolutely. I wanted to make sure that every line of information I put into a buyer persona is going to inform something. So it's either going to inform a product development or a new feature or how customer success can help and support a customer on a call or how a content marketer can take this and say, okay, oh, I've now got 28 ideas that I know like pieces of content I can now execute on and go off. I mean, because that's where it originated for, for me was I would get Mary Marketer, 28, lives in the city, is a, you know, a marketer who struggles with technical implications, um, has a cat, wants to be Wonder Woman, and uh, loves ramen noodles. Now go create 15 pieces of content that's going to support her, uh, you know, market to her, reach her in the best, most empathetic way. Like you can't, that doesn't tell me anything that I can now use to inform a content strategy. So that's why I was like, we got to do something better here. Do you think that that this experience of, you know, possibly just synthesizing and reading a lot of information and scrutinizing it in different ways, do you think this has made you a better than average kind of bullshit detector? <laughs> I don't know. I don't or know is that I'm... the Texan in you? Or... <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, um, you know, I, I don't, bullshit detector, that might be challenging because I have a tendency to trust people a lot. It's more information. Like, is this information bullshit or are, are we smoke and mirrors? I'm, I am very adamant about being transparent and in my own business. Like, I don't ever want to perceive myself as like better or greater than we are. We are where we are. I know what I know. Um, and those are the things I'm, I'm okay saying, like, look, this is where we're, we're strong and where my strengths are. Um, but I'm also good saying, nope, I, you know, I'm not good at that. So bullshit detector, perhaps, um, it really does. I want to make sure that I'm looking at things through a lens that's just going to make sense and be actionable and, and is helpful. Like why, why not be helpful in a way that, that people are going to use? I feel like if you've got a better foundation of who your buyers are, we're then going to be able to market to them in a, in a more empathetic way. If I'm trying to say these millions of people are actually like one person, they look like one person, I'm lying to myself. And I'm creating crap. Okay, I'm not, I don't want to say it's crap for them, but I'm creating content for them that's not going to fit who they are because I've pretended that, you know, 150 million people look like one Mary Marketer who's white and 28. They're not. 
there's a bunch of people in that segment and we need to honor that. We need to acknowledge that. And then can we start to create stuff that's actually going to be useful to them? Yeah. It sounds like there's this prevailing principle of, you know, if we're going to do this, why don't we do it right? Yeah. A hundred percent. Like why, why not though? Like why not do it right? Are there other things outside of buyer personas that in the marketing space, content marketing, maybe specifically that frustrate you, or you think they're misguided, or you think they could use a re-sculpting in the same way that you've done with buyer personas? Sure. Content for content's sake. Like we just, we have to publish once a week. So let's do that. Well, says who, who, I mean, I don't know, as a customer, there's not one product I use. And I use quite a bit to run both businesses that I'm like, oh, I need to check their blog every single week. Like I'm just instant to hear what, you know, Typeform has to say, or what HubSpot said this week, or what Calendly is doing. I don't, if I have a problem, I'm like, oh, I need, then I'll, I'll go to them and I'll try to figure it out. Um, but it's rarely that we need content for content's sake. It needs to serve a purpose. It needs to have a means to an end. Um, yeah. So I think so definitely in content marketing, there needs to be some just understanding and efficiency. I think we get in a bubble. We as in just marketers in general, and we're working hard on products. We love our product. We're ready to do this work. And we kind of get in the bubble where it's like, of course, people are going to want to hear what we have to say. Like we worked really hard on this and this is good. It's good, high quality stuff. I'm not saying stuff is crap. It's really good. Um, and so of course people are going to want it, but it, it's harder to say, but do they actually want it? And what do they really need? And that that's where um, knowing them better comes into play. hundred mm, percent. It all does come back to kind of know your audience. Um, and, and that's like a guiding principle you can use for so many things. I have two quick mini rants to complement that on the, um, the published content for content sake thing. One, and we're both content marketing professionals, right? Like I run an agency, you run a business, um, but I think we, we can... There's this thing that I saw. It was a tweet uh, a long time ago, I think from Joe Polizzi from Content Marketing Institute. And he mm -hmm. said, like, he wouldn't buy from a business if they don't have a blog. And I'm like, well, that's, I mean, I would definitely buy from a business if they don't have a blog. Like, I buy my dish soap and all that stuff, yeah. you know? So there's this general principle of like applying one, it's like a Maslow's hammer, right? Like, if mm -hmm. you go, all you have is a hammer, every problem's going to look like a nail. Yes. And I think like this, this is broadly applied in content marketing when you get, you, you've got this mimetic effect of like your competitors are doing content like this. This industry is doing content like this. Therefore, we have to do the same thing. Yep. But it's like nobody stops to think, like, do customers even care if we write about this stuff? You know, there's this like very high level, just like, should we even do content? And then there's the second level rant, which is this, this, uh, you know, content as like a publication or, you know, your, mm -hmm. your blog is a, a library, not a publication concept from animals. And if you've got 20 blog posts and you're doing an SEO play, some brands will wait and be like, all right, we've got to publish one at a time, one per week or something like that. And it's like, well, what are you, what are you trying to do? Like, if you're trying to go for organic, just publish them all. Like, yeah. Nobody's like waiting, you know, like a, a, a HBO series for like the next episode on the edge of their seat, just right. give them the content, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. I'm not sitting by like twiddling my fingers, just waiting for their launch date of, you know, whatever blog post. I agree with that. Uh, like 100%, especially where, um, I mean, to your first point, it it's important to just wait, what was your first point again? I'm sorry. I did have this concept that like everybody needs to do content or everybody needs to have a blog. Otherwise nobody's going to buy from your business. Right. It's exactly. Just on its face. Absurd. And I don't know if I've never looked, I mean, the tools that I use, I don't know if Calendly has a blog. I don't know if Typeform has a blog. I don't know if Fireflies.a has a blog. I have no idea because it's never mattered to me purchasing, um, you know, their product and using their product. It's, it, it is, it's an interesting thing. And maybe it's self-centered and maybe it's just, you know, us thinking that we've been told you have to do this over and over again. I mean, Content Marketing Institute, you know, like Joey's got the book. But to your point, Kate said that the other day, Kate Bauer said, um, you know, if the, the quote, if you're a hammer is everything a nail, I find myself asking that question all the time. Am I being the hammer here? Am I being the hammer here? Because through my eyes, interviews and surveys could fix everything. Any business problem you have, let's do an interview. Let's do some interviews. Let's figure out, let's send a survey out. Boom. We'll have all of our answers there. But that's not necessarily the truth, right? Like it's complex. There's a lot of nuance. There's things that need to go on. Um, so I have to ask myself, am I being a hammer? Is the, am I, is it the only situation? Um, obviously 
interviews and surveys aren't going to fix everything. So there are product issues and there are, you know, all kinds of things. So it's, a, I think for content marketing, especially and content marketers, it's an important question to ask. Are we seeing this through our one lens? And Adam Grant's Think Again is a great book to read, to reset your thinking and like go through the process of like, how do I ask different questions to see if whether or not I'm stuck in my thinking, if this is the only way things are done. Um, because it's good, or is it because this is just the process or the way it's been? What's the quick synopsis of that book? It sounds interesting. It is interesting. So Adam Grant is a social scientist, and he has basically done studies and surveys um, and ob- observations on people who got stuck in their thinking. Um, a lot of it is some business examples, um, but who essentially grinned and bear it, like went down and just said, this is the way it's got to be. We're, we're stuck in, in our ways. Um, and just did not see success. And so he goes through a few different chapters and each chapter has a nice story with data backing it up. Um, But the the overall concept is be able to um, step back and take a higher level look and see where does there need to be some some rethinking in your decisions, where maybe have you just gotten stuck in a loop of your own kind of like just ego essentially. Mm-hmm. I think it's so easy to do that when you're looking outside, but it's so hard to do that when it's your thing. Like we were talking yeah. about with content, like, are we just applying this hammer to like all problems? Like your point on like the customer surveys and customer interviews. I think about that with experimentation all the time. And it's like, what works for one company could be totally different for another company. And like admitting to that, it, admitting to myself, that is such a hard thing, but that yeah. self-awareness can lead, lead me to an actually effective solution versus just trying to like fit the square peg through the round hole. Yep. And it goes back to what you said, being able to have the ability to ask a question that's going to get to an insight. So as a consultant, as somebody who runs an agency, it's our jobs, right? To kind of like pull out what the core problem is from the client. They come to you and they think it's this, but then by the time you're done with, you know, an onboarding call or or your customer discovery call, you've realized what their real problem is closer to somewhere else. It's not even what they think it is. This is the pinch they're feeling, but the core of the problem could be something else. So you really have to be able to ask those kinds of questions that can then lead to the understanding of where the, the real issues might be. It sounds like your superpower, so to speak, is asking great questions. It really is. Yes, you nailed that. Um, I was the kid who was told, first of all, my grandmother, my nana, um, I remember very clearly in the kitchen one day, she said, Adrian, stop asking why. That is rude. <laughs> And and I just thought about it. I was like, you know, now I get paid like all this money to ask why. Literally, why is one of the most powerful questions I have. Um, I love thinking about how best to ask a question. So what I'll do is I'll sit down with my clients. I'm like, what do you need to know? Where are there gaps in your knowledge? What are you still trying to understand about your own customers? And they'll tell me that. And then I get to figure out what questions can I ask that's going to get those answers. And in a clear, concise Um, most effective way. And so I will sit and brainstorm and think about question design and question development for a long time. So let me, let me put you on the spot here. Do you have any advice with regards to podcast uh, Mm. interviews and asking good questions on podcasts? It doesn't have to be like specific, like here's the question you should ask people, but do you have any like pet peeves when you go on podcasts and like you know, people ask questions in a certain way. What advice would you give to me with, you know, asking great questions in mind uh, to run better podcast interviews? Yeah, I think so when I'm doing interviews for customer discovery, and it would probably translate well to podcasts is know who you're on the phone with. Have an idea of who you're talking to. um, What else have they done? So what I'll do is I'll get on and I'll read, maybe they've published some things, maybe they've been on Twitter, um, or on their LinkedIn, I kind of figure out, what have they already said? What are some points they've made? Um, and then that helps to, I can more quickly go deeper than if I'm starting from scratch. So I can say, well, you mentioned this premise over here. Now, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Um, that Can you tell me a little bit more about that question mm-hmm. is my favorite and the most powerful. Um, one that Michelle Hansen said, she's about to release a book on qualitative question, customer development, discovery. Um, I think it's called Deploy Empathy. I just, that's a big plug for her. Um, I pre-purchased it, so I'm excited about it. Uh, she says to, if you're hearing an emotion, so maybe your podcast interviewee is, is telling about a, a hard time or a challenge or something like that, 
to empathize with their emotions. So, wow, that sounds like that was hard or that sounded very challenging. Hmm. Would you mind sharing that experience more? Or would you mind telling me more about that? Um, having that uh, empathetic response where you're validating their feelings, they're safer, they're more comfortable, you get me, now I'm going to open up a little bit more. Um, that's always, that works really well in all kinds of interviews. Yeah, that's that's great advice. I love the one on following up on uh, what somebody just said and kind of like digging in deeper. I think that's something when I go on other podcasts, if it's like, well, actually, like it's kind of a pet peeve of mine when I get a, a list of questions that people are, I they're going to ask and then they just run down that list. Oh, I'm like, yeah. I, I could have just written this out for you, you know, mm-hmm. but also like there's oftentimes a lot of gold nuggets in the things that you say, in the responses, in the in-between points between the questions that you can kind of like veer off that path. And I think that's scary for an interviewer or really anytime you're in a conversation that's, um, you know, less, less uh, informal or less friendly, um, you know, like it's not like a, a drink at the bar or something right. because then you're like, all right, well, what happens when we go off this path? But I think having that courage to kind of go, you know, down the winding path, you sometimes get more interesting insights. 100%. And that's what I find. And actually, I just spoke with an interviewer um, today and I said, you know, we create a list of questions, but it's not a script. I don't ever expect if, if you are on question number three and the customer takes 20 minutes to explain this question and, and they're going deep in their storytelling, let them go. Those insights are going to be far better than if you were like, okay, great. Now, um, n- my next question is, da, 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 da. and I've been on interviews like that where you know they just have to check through their checklist. Very similar for podcasts. Listening is really hard. And so that's going to be one of the most important things. I say, if you can listen and actively listen to the interviewee, you're going to be able to ask follow-up questions or secondary questions um, in a better and more genuine and curiosity way. Like, just be curious, just be a curious person about their experience and let that kind of lead the conversation. I agree. I think you're doing great. (laughs) Thank you. That's very (laughs) meta. We've gotten here. Is there, again, to to double down on this, is there... um, is there a way to get people to open up? Uh, like when people, when in, in like a customer interview, and I think this is really relevant to a podcast, like you find sometimes people are giving stock replies, like things mm-hmm. that they kind of, they're expecting you would like to hear um, yeah. or like stock answers. And that, that happens in podcasts quite a bit. You can hear it even on like some very professional, very popular podcasts. And I think a goal is to really get more honest truths, both, both from a podcast interview and from customer interviews. You don't just yeah. want to hear what they think you want to hear. So do you have any ideas on, on how to open people up when you may be getting those stock responses? Yeah. So one of the best um, little tricks that I use is at the very end, maybe I've got five or 10 minutes left. Um, and maybe the interview's just been kind of dry and short. Like they're just like, I just want to get this over with. Um, I ask them, so is there anything else I should know? Is there anything else that you'd like to share? For a customer discovery interview, that's where they'll end up giving me the greatest insights, the most concise language. I mean, that little question does really, really well. Um, Also, I found that I don't come in cold. So when I'm scheduling interviews, and like, for instance, with the podcast, like you did, you were asking on social, we were tagged in. So we were already introduced. It wasn't just like you cold uh, emailed me and out of the blue. So what I like to do when I'm setting up customer interviews is the client will then introduce me. So maybe they've got um, you know, somebody that they've been emailing within the company or a company influencer who's well-known. I'll have that person intro me. So I'm coming in warm. They know who I am. I'm coming in with the, the authority and the co-sign from someone that they trust. So that usually is able to start off the conversation um, with an easier kind of way. And I also let them know, I can't, you know, I'm here. I want to hear what you're doing. This is the the purpose of this thing. Um, and then if they kind of go off on, you know, this is the problem and can you fix it? I can't fix anything. So that kind of gives them a little bit more freedom to be free and um, explain their real grievances in a, in a more, I don't know, trustworthy way because they know I'm not with the company. I'm not trying to fix their problem. I'm just going to take all these things to the company and say, now here's how your people feel. So that that tends to help uh, open up the conversation and and keep things going. Nice. So it's really like an uh, idea of architecting a safe environment. And then also, I love that question. um, Is there anything else you'd like to share? Anything else I should know? I've often veered away from that in podcasts because sometimes it's a little open-ended, but I wonder if that's something that, you know, I could incorporate and then 
you just get an interesting explosion of honesty or something. Yeah, it works within context. So within the buyer um, customer discovery interview, they know what I'm trying to do. We're talking about one particular product, one particular company. So that is usually where it's like, oh yeah, you forgot to ask me about whatever, 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 or you didn't ask me about this, or I wanted to make sure you knew this thing. Um, whereas a podcast, you know, that may not be, like you said, it's, it's very open-ended. So if you were to ask me, what else should I know? I'd be like, um, find um, me <laughs> over here or <laughs> yeah, it would be challenging. It would be uh, kind of put on the spot to think like, oh, what kind of interesting thing should I say right now? Like, this is my last chance. Yes. Yeah. Um, I was, <laughs> and those, what is most interesting about you questions? Like, I wish that podcast people would tell me that they're going to ask that question beforehand. Because when I get asked that question, what's the most interesting thing about you? Or what books do you love? It's like blank. Like my whole head just is like, I yeah, get no, anxiety on those. I don't know who I am. I don't know what I've read recently. I don't even know. Um, I don't like the so tell me about yourself questions either. Yeah. I don't know I like, why. It's just like an awkward journey, like describing like where you like, what do you want me to say? <laughs> yeah. And the, those are the things where I just kind of go through like, okay, I have a, I have a standard response. You you'll get my canned response. If you're say, tell me about yourself. Well, then you'll get, yeah, you'll get the response. I've given 25 other podcast interviewers. <laughs> so that's actually, I have two things. One, one, I don't really do in podcasts, but I do in like, if you go to like a leadership, uh, like camp or training or something like that, you always get put together with groups of people who all want to seem smart to each other. Nobody knows each other. Yeah. And even if you join a new company or something like that, or if you're meeting new employees, you often have this like frozen first response where nobody kind of want to ma- wants to make a, a silly error or sound stupid in front of their new coworkers or something like that. So what I do is I just immediately say something silly you know, yeah. or wrong or like put myself out there in this ridiculous way, which kind of breaks the ice. And everybody else, you, you can feel this almost collective sigh and they're like, oh, okay, all right, Good. I can relax yeah. a little bit, drop my shoulders. And I find that's really effective in group settings. And then on podcasts, I like to, um, there's probably a word for this or a phrase for this. But when people expect a certain order of questions, I like to do like a record skip and just send like a, a curveball. So it it sort of breaks your your system one brain and puts you back in system two where you're starting yeah. to deliberately think through your responses because you're caught off guard. You're like, oh, I didn't I didn't think we we're going there. All right. <laughs> and it kind of like rewakes you up or something like that. Yeah. You know, it takes you off of autopilot. I love that. That's really good. And there's a totally different cadence with a podcast, right? Than like a customer discovery interview. And I think, I think podcast interviewing is, is a challenge for sure. Cause you're not just like looking, cause what I'm doing when I'm doing an interview for customers, I'm looking for key insights. Like I know the kind of answers I need to be getting, not that I'm feeding them to answer me in a particular way, but I know that there are particular insights we're looking to learn. So what are the, whatever those insights may be, there's a, a clear direction that I'm trying to hit at um, for a podcast. I mean, like we didn't know we were going to start talking about podcasts, so it can kind of go in any kind of direction. You just have to be very um, flexible in a way totally. that's it's totally different. It's a lot more improv. Absolutely. So uh, this is a question where um, I know the answer is depends, but I don't want to hear it depends. Uh, okay. So what are there any questions that typically elicit interesting insights when you're doing these customer interviews? Maybe like focus solely on content marketing uh, for maybe reader personas. Are there any like stock questions that you, you just always ask or some version of them? Maybe you, you customize it in the individual setting. But yes. um, yeah, what are, what are good questions to ask? Good questions. So I like to know, um, you know, how did they find us? How do they even, like, if, especially if I'm doing um, one for content strategy, I'm looking at my question list right now, by the way, that's why my eyes are going crazy. Um, <laughs> do they read the content? Do you know we have a blog? You'd be so surprised how many customers, or maybe you wouldn't because we're not out there like twiddling our thumbs, waiting for our products to release blogs. But some of your customers, your best customers don't know you have a blog and they don't care. Um, or maybe they're like, oh yeah, I get a newsletter in my email. Yeah, I, I, I see that. Um, and I'll say, have, do you use the blog to help you? Like, have you had, ever had an issue and you've gone to the blog to help you solve it? Um, things like that, that really will inform how are your buyers actually using your content? Um, and sometimes it's like, oh yeah, I love the white papers. The white papers are amazing. And they spend a lot of time talking about the white papers, but the majority of them didn't know that we do... Um, you know, infographics or that we have, you know, a ton of podcasts or fireside chats or like whatever other kind of content we have. So then we're able to say, okay, really, 
we're exhausting a lot of effort in creating a weekly blog post. What we could do is create a monthly white paper and just switch our effort into original research and things like that. Um, some other really good questions specifically for content marketing. Um, what, and I think we mentioned this a little bit earlier, but like, what problems do you have? What, where, what do you, or I'll ask specifically about features or pro, like some aspect of the product itself. Do you know that this is available? Um, or have you ever used this feature? And, um, or do, did you understand how to go about this thing? And sometimes the clients don't. They're like, oh no, I don't think I'm using it to its full capability. Or I feel like it's really complex and I haven't really figured it all out yet. Or yeah, it was super simple. The, the wizard really helped me out. So now I know, okay, either we've got to like simplify some things or we need a wizard that can come in and like walk them step by step, or we need to email that the onboarding process needs to be different. Um, a whole lot of things can be informed by just figuring out how they use the product and like what their thoughts are along the way of that, that usability. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I want to switch directions just a little bit more towards like your kind of personal goals and career. Um, yeah. What's your long game? Like, where are you aiming? Yes. Okay. So I am aiming to have a million dollar consultancy with Best Buyer Persona. I want there to be a team of five that is a myself, that is, I have a product manager, an interviewer, and a data analyst, and a salesperson. And that whole team runs it. We execute on buyer personas. I go off and do, but I've thought this out to the detail. Yeah, this I go is off. very specific. I love it. <laughs> I go off and do buyer persona workshops in-house for companies. Um, I'll do two a month, three days a week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And I'll do that every other week. Um, and then I want to do four personas a month. And I want us to bring in um, like hundred and fifty dollars to $175,000 a month, helping other companies, like learning who their customers are using this information, um, really get into tools and the, the digital intelligence analysis, because that's a gap in this, um, this, this tool, buyer personas, that nobody else is doing. Nobody else doing a buyer persona does interviews, surveys, social listening, and digital intelligence analysis. So I feel like I've met a need there. Um, and yeah, I want to do that for five or six years, maybe 10 years, and then retire to my farm. Love it. How did you come up with those specific numbers and specific roles? I'm a goal setter and a goal crusher. So in order for me to meet my goals, I have to visualize them very clearly and just really see and, and what it is going to be became clear this year. Um, if you would have asked me this question in December, I would have said, I don't know, I think it's going to be like this, maybe like the, uh, uh, I was still trying to decide, is it a one man band? Is it a team? Is it an agency? Um, and then it really became clear in the early spring that, no, I want to have a lean team. I want to have highly capable people who can do these tasks and we execute on four of them a month. Um, and the reason I came up with that number, I want to earn a million dollars a year because I dream about being an angel investor. That's another thing. And part of the curriculum to be an angel investor is to have a million dollars like liquid cash, I think available. It can't include like your home value mm. or anything like that. Um, so I would love for Best Buyer Persona to then turn around and be able to invest in other startups and founders and things like that. The whole like founders really do, they just light me up. I feel like they're inventors, they're modern day Edison's and Nikola Tesla's. And I think they're, they're changing the world. I love that. How do you do your goal setting and planning and visualization? Do you have a time period when you do that? Do you have a yeah. vision board? <laughs> you know, what, do you, what does this look like? Sometimes I have vision boards. I've done vision boards in the past. Um, so I think I've always been this way. I just like to create a goal and then work towards it. But I really refined it after I read Think and Grow Rich. And mm. so that book said, sit down, write like three times a day and be very specific. How much money, how many clients, da, da, da. Um, I find I actually don't do great when I have a money goal. When I say I want to make this much money, even though I just said I want to earn a million dollar consultancy. Um, but in the short term, it's really about the number of people we're going to serve. And I find that I choose better projects that way. I make better decisions that way when I'm really uh, leaning towards and the goal is growth and not just money. If it's towards money, I tend to 
get a little, uh, I'll, I'll, you know, you take poor fit clients and, and things like that. So I have to be clear. I want to work with these kinds of customers. I want to help these kinds of companies. Um, I have to include who I'm helping in the goal itself. So Think and Grow Rich really kind of solidified it. You sit down each day, you journal, you like dream out your best day. And, you know, I would go in as much detail as like what kind of pajamas I was wearing when I walked down the stairs and what was the view and where am I living and um, just our daily schedule. And then I just think about it often and I talk about it and I I publicly announce it like this. You know, I make sure that that kind of keeps me accountable. Um, I did it like sticky notes when I wanted to write in HubSpot. I was recently published in HubSpot and three years ago I made it my goal. Like that's what I wanted to do. Uh, and it took a while, but I did, we got it. Um, and that was just a simple, like top three companies I want to write for. And I wrote it on a sticky note and I left it up on my wall so that I could see it every single day. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. I, I, I'm obsessed with this idea of, uh, kind of goals and now, so I started saying this is a joke. Like, uh, when we started the agency, I'm like, all right, let's just manifest some clients. Like that's all we have to do. Visualize manifest, but there's been some crazy kind of coincidences maybe that that have come up with this manifestation process like recently I accepted a new I I do the agency and I've got a full-time job working in experimentation and uh when I was at HubSpot I wrote like a dream job title and job description for myself that I kind of wanted to grow into at HubSpot and my old manager just texted me a couple weeks ago with that document and to a T it's the job that I have now like absolutely like the most accurate description and I didn't second think it, you know, I just wrote it once. I kind of dreamed it out and yeah. now it's, it's kind of there. And that happens often, you know, like I'll do now I do kind of yearly goal sessions where I review the past year, um, including like what kind of goals and milestones I wanted to set, which mm-hmm. they're mostly milestones. It's not really how I get there. It's just sort of setting that point at which I know it's complete. And yeah. then I can leave the, the, um, kind of tactical details up to fate or daily choice or whatever that is. But I, I set those, you know, with the reflection from the past year in mind. And it's remarkable how many of those I hit without even like kind of thinking about it every day, just yep. by almost setting the intention. Yes, absolutely. And that's what I was going to say. I've, I'm not great at writing it three times a day. Like that was a lot. Um, I think I, I write it once and it does. It, it allows you to like, I get very clear on it and then you can set it aside. And I just know now it's just a matter of putting in the work and putting in the effort and it'll happen. Uh, who are you chasing? Like, who who do you look to- towards for inspiration? Oh, I love this question. That's a good one. Um, and immediately, April Dunford comes to mind. And I don't know. I'm not chasing her. I'm not gonna like. But she is. Um, she's my mentor in a way, a little bit. We've had a few conversations, um, and she's crushing it in the consultant world. And I just, I think she's she's so smart, and she's done a great thing. And like positioning, she's become like, if you think of positioning, you think of April, she's got the book, she does her workshops. Um, I think she's doing a great job. So I want to, I want to be like her when I grow up. She's, she's phenomenal. Super cool. Um, do you, are you deliberately doing that with buyer personas, trying to create that one-to-one connection where you think buyer personas and you think about you? Is that deliberately crafted? 100%. When somebody wants a buyer persona, I want them to think you need Adrian. If, if, if there's a conversation out and they're like, oh, we're working on a buyer persona, we're getting really stuck. You need Adrian. I mean, like wherever it is, Silicon Valley, New York, Miami, think of Adrian. If you're thinking of your buyer persona and it's starting to work. So mm-hmm. people are asking questions on Twitter about um, buyer personas or jobs to be done buyer personas because that's really kind of what I'm preaching. Uh, and I get tagged in those posts. And that's so exciting to like think that I'm beginning to be associated with that product. Are you ever worried about um, getting that too attached to to your personal brand? And in terms of like, I, I ask this selfishly because I have bifurcated my personal brand into the CRO and experimentation world. Some uh, set of my audience kind of knows me for that, and then there's the content side. And it's it's almost like I'm I'm that uh, Viridian's donkey, right? Between the the water and the food, so maybe yeah. I'm going to die of starvation and thirst. But I, I do worry um, because I've I've seen this happen um, in the past. Although I guess it's le- to a less degree um, over the long term. But with Pep uh, from CXL, mm-hmm. he had spoken to me about how difficult it was to strip that badge of the CRO guy. Yeah, you know now he's in a totally different business, or not totally different, but he's now you know marketing to product marketers and talking about positioning and messaging. Yeah. So it's taken him a lot to strip that label of being the A/B testing guru. Does that ever cross your mind, or is that 
something you'll worry about later? Or how do you think about that? Yeah, um, definitely worry about it later, because that's really what I want. Um, and maybe and so I, I think of this often as when people say like you niche down, like go ahead and that's what you're announcing. That's what you're talking about. But then maybe behind the scenes or when you're actually working with your clients, you're doing an array of different things. So whereas, you know, I'm only talking about buyer personas and content strategies, I might come on and there may be a time where it's like, okay, we're actually doing just market research or we're creating buyer personas and content. Really, there's not much else I would do. It is buyer personas and content strategies, but behind the scenes with the clients. I mean, I've done as a content lead retainer, which is involved in the content strategies, I've done everything from like just filing stuff and organizing and content libraries and, you know, a lot of those admin administrative type type tasks that need to be done. Um, You know, I do those as well. But what publicly you'll hear me say, I'm not going to sit here and talk about how to create a content library necessarily, because that's not what I want to be known for. I want to be known for buyer personas and content strategies. Um, But yeah, so for me, being connected to the personal brand is more about failure and success and it really being mine. Like if this makes it, that's great. Like I, I did something and if I fail, it's because I failed, right? Like I can't go and say, well, you know, some, so it was somebody else, something else happened. It would be my failure. So that's, mm-hmm. that's where having a personal brand is, is concerning to me. Mm, interesting. I do think that the fear that at least I have is probably overrated because once you build up that personal brand in a given niche, like yourself with buyer personas, I, I don't think it would be that difficult to step away and say like, all right, now I'm like technical SEO or something like, I, I think it would take a little bit, but yeah. I actually don't think it would be that difficult once you've already built up your audience to switch to another thing, kind of like Pep did for the positioning and messaging thing. Yeah. And it's kind of what I've done just since December with buyer personas. I mean, Pep, what kicked this off was I was on Winter, one of his Mm -hmm. very first uh, chats, those little webinar things that he was doing or that he still does. Um, And it was, I, I pitched him three ideas and he was like, I like the buyer persona one, do that. And I talked it and then people started coming in and being interested. And so while the idea and the company started three years ago, really the, the execution of it is very, very recent, like within the last eight months. So this is totally unrelated, but we stole that idea from Pep uh, for the Winter Games series. And now we do something similar, the Omniscient Office Hours. <laughs> it's it. like a monthly yes. webinar series. So if you ever want to give that talk on buyer personas at our event, we would love to have you as well. I would love to. I'm there. <laughs> so do you mind if I do a couple of rapid fire questions here? Go for it. Let's see. Is, right, it, actually, is it like mental? Like, is it word association rapid fire or? It's it's like um, a verbal Sudoku puzzle. It's very okay. difficult. Um, <laughs> no, actually, I think you answered the first one. What's a career choice you've considered but didn't pursue? I oh. guess that would be law. Yeah, law school. Yeah, that was definitely one. Quite a bit. Also, I was a um, pre and postnatal fitness instructor for a short time. Oh, wow. That was interesting. That was fun. Um, and then I was also a food blogger for like six months. And that was also interesting and fun. So that honestly sounds fun. I know a couple of people who have done it with Instagram and built up pretty big audiences in like their city. And it sounds cool. I mean, you get like free food. You just kind of walk around to different restaurants, taking yeah. photos of the food you get for free. Yeah, sounds pretty absolutely. cool. It does. It does sound cool. <laughs> uh, do you consider yourself more of an artist or more of a scientist and why? Oh, a scientist. I Even though I failed science in school, what I have learned, or biology, what I've learned is science is the scientific method. So you take an idea. What is our idea? What's our question? Then you gather your materials. What do I need? to find out more about this question. And then you just do the thing. Like you're just doing an experiment. You perform your experiment and then you look at the results and you say, what happened? Okay, now we need to do it again. So the scientific method literally lays out my entire process. If you could create your own category in Jeopardy, what would it be? Would you Mm. get every question right? Oh my gosh, that I would get every question right. Mad Men, 100% it would be (laughs) Mad Men. I love that show. That was I, I watched that when I was in college when I was studying advertising. So it perfectly coincided with kind of that tr- career trajectory. I was obsessed with it. It's it's so well written every episode. I love Dawn. I love Peggy and Dawn's relationship. I watched it before I knew what copywriting was. I mean, I guess I was learning about it through the show, um, but I was more interested in the characters. And then I watched it later 
after having studied copywriting. And I was like, oh, that's what we're doing. Okay. So like more lines were connected. It's, it's an amazing show. I also, I mean, I love a, a Roger Sterling, you know, he's my favorite, but I, I think Jeff Sauer wrote this blog post on like how to structure your agency and like who to co-found it with. And he used Mad Men as like the analogy or example um, to say like, you always need like the, the purist, the artist, the person who like produces the great work. You need the Don Draper, mm-hmm. you need the, uh, the wine and dine, you know, the, the person who brings in the business, gets the clients, keeps Pete. them around. You need a Pete, Pete Campbell. And, and Roger. Right? Yes, Roger. That's and true. then you need the business person. You need the operations, the one who keeps the ship afloat. And that's the, the Burt Stanley Cooper. Cooper. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Burt yeah. Cooper. And it's, it's so accurate, like in the yeah. real world, like we've actually, I think we have some relationship like that at our agency and it, it really does run smoother when you all have that, like superpower that lane yeah and hopefully everybody knows it and loves their lane and like a pete campbell like know your lane and love it absolutely um is there a given role that you like to play best in your your businesses in uh, among those three roles yeah um let's see amongst those three i think i can tell you the one i don't love is the business running person like Mm -hmm. if i could just say somebody else invoice somebody else manage like the the client issues or solve that challenge i just want to like come in and do the thing but i love i love running a business i love it being mine but that's probably my least favorite part and my favorite part is um just the the creativity getting to think and strategize the strategy part is my favorite so the puzzle Don, don draper yeah, I love it. I'm I'm probably the same way with my aversion to the uh I don't want to say the business side, but like I don't I don't even like counting money. Like I don't even yeah. like doing any accounting or anything like that. I like to just like get clients, do the work, and then like the bills will take care of themselves, you yeah. know. I'm the worst. Like I will forget to invoice and it'll be like four days later and I'm like, oh yeah, I should like I need to get paid. Getting paid is good. Um it yeah, setting fees and rates. Oh, budgets and all that oh, stuff. <laughs> I hate it. Like usually my husband is a great partner for me for that. Cause I'll be like, okay, this is what I'm thinking. And he can say, no, 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 no. And then I, I also have some other male friends who are in the business and I'll say, okay, here's what I'm thinking. How, you know, is this a good rate? And they'll be like, no, Adrian, you, there it should be more than that. Usually that's the answer is like, here's what I charge for that. Um, yeah. So I would, it would be cool, but I don't want to, I don't want to be anybody else's employee. Like I, I really like running my own thing. So it's just kind of like, okay, this is a part of it and I've bucked up and gotten it done. So, but is it my favorite? No, not really. For sure. Which talent would you most like to have? Oh, like in the world talent. I would love to sing. I sing all the time, but I'm awful at it. So it'd be nice if other people enjoyed my singing as much as I enjoy to sing. You would be shocked how many people answer that question with singing, including <laughs> myself. Like, I, I think that would be my pick too. Yeah. I mean, something that's so naturally driven too. It's like, you, you can learn to a certain degree to hit, you know, notes and, and have better timbre or whatever the words yeah. are. But at a certain point, you're born, born with the voice and the vocal power that you have. So it's like, that would probably be the best like magic wand, like wish for just an amazing voice, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. I've, I like when I was little, I would sing in concerts for churches and stuff and you know, at the end, it would be like, oh, just good, good job, kind of like I was so off key, everything was awful, but I was a kid. So they were happy with it. Um, yeah, that would, I would for sure love to do that. Love that one. What uh, blogs, podcast influencers do you love to follow right now? Hmm, influencers, blogs, podcasts, do I love to follow? Um, I am really impressed with what Rand Fishkin is doing with Spark Toro and like trying to change some uh, terms in the marketing world as someone else who's trying to do that. I get how challenging it is. Um, I don't actually like podcasts. I have to be very intentional with, so it's not like I just kind of sit down and stream a lot of podcasts. Um, and let's see what else influencers. I mentioned Rand. Um, Oh, Michael Bredo. I don't know if people know him, but he is like a tools guy. He's, he does, um, an agency and he's on LinkedIn. He knows so many of the different like digital analytic analysis tools. And um, he he's doing some pretty cool things too. Nice. Is there anything else you'd like to share? <laughs> um, yeah, just I for content marketers, especially, I think, you know, maybe if the one tidbit, if we could say, this is what we'd like you to take away from today's chat, it would be to, to step outside yourself and ask, am I being the hammer 
to a nail situation and, and really trying to identify the strategy that you're creating and is it serving your actual audience or is it serving your in-house team? Is it serving like you guys, the company, or is it serving your people? I love it. That was a powerful ending. And yeah. also, obviously, you should tell people where to find you online. Oh, sure. So um, bestbuyerpersona.com is that website. And then um, adriannicole.com is that one. And I'm on Twitter too much at Adrian Nicole. So I'm there. I'm on LinkedIn as well. But if you go over there, it might take me a while to find you. Awesome. Well, thank you, Adrian. Thanks, Alex. This was so nice. 